Hello and welcome to Matcha Mornings, part of the Wander Barn Podcast Network. I'm your host, Amanda Kingsmith, and I'm excited to dive deep on topics around holistic health, the power of food, hormone health, how the practices of yoga can impact our health and well-being, and much more. So grab your cup of tea, settle in, and let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome back for another episode of the Matcha Mornings podcast. I am very excited to have you joining me for today's episode of the show. And today's guest on the podcast is somebody who you have met before in a previous episode. It's Steph Galante, and we did an episode all on fall wellness using the tools of Ayurveda. And we're doing another episode to talk about winter wellness. Winter is right around the corner for most of us around the world. And if you're like me and you are from Canada, winter probably already feels like it's there. Officially, winter comes closer to the end of December. So we still have a little bit of fall left officially and some time to prepare for winter. But winter really brings about the colder climates, snow for many of us. It brings about darker shorter days and sometimes a slowing down. And so on this episode of the show, Steph is going to dive into six Ayurvedic tips for winter wellness. We'll talk about how to feel your best this winter, including what to eat, how to exercise, how to set up your schedule, sleep, and much more. So I hope that you get a lot out of this episode. I hope that you enjoy this episode as much as I did. And without further ado, here is Steph. Welcome back to the podcast, Steph. I'm really happy to have you back with me here today. Thank you so much. I'm so excited. Yeah, I'm uh, really excited to have you back on the show. For those listeners who maybe aren't familiar with you, we did a pretty fun episode on Ayurveda for fall season. And since, you know, now the seasons are starting to change again, we're going to talk about winter season, which is my spoiler alert, my least favorite, (laughs) my least favorite season (laughs) of all the seasons, but maybe you can give me some things to make me love winter a little bit more. Um, but since listeners have already heard a little bit about your story and what you're up to and all that stuff we recorded in summer, I was in Canada. I'd love to hear just a little bit, like, what have you been up to over the last couple of months since we chatted last? Well, it's definitely been an interesting time. I have two little kids who are seven and five. And so they return to school. Um, And, you know, after summer break, it's always an interesting transition back to school. And my little guy was was going to school for the first time. He's in kindergarten. And while my older son had gone back to school in person at the end of last school year, it wasn't a full day. And so it's been very interesting (laughs) these last weeks, you know, adjusting to everyone being back. My husband's a teacher. I also teach at the local university. And so, you know, we're all kind of back in mode. (laughs) So it's been quite the adjustment (laughs) on a personal level, for sure. And then professional level too. It's just been, I feel like, you know, the same as everybody else, you know, the people who I serve, and I'm sure your listeners too have been going through that adjustment period, um, which is always an adjustment, you know, under normal circumstances. But, you know, I think much more given the circumstances still of the pandemic and all of that too. So it's been quite a ride, I have to say. Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, I would imagine it's been kind of like a bit of a transition having, you know, people going back to work and school and stuff is were, were your kids like your kids must have been home for a good chunk of time throughout the pandemic, no? Oh yeah, yeah, they were home. So I'm losing track of the years and months. <laughs> oh my gosh, I know. It's like what month of this pandemic are we on now? Is it 18? Is it 20? Are we at 2 years yet? <laughs> That's right. So my older one, he went back to school or no, he was virtual for the entire school year, except for April. He went back of last year. Um, and so he was back in school for about two months. He might've gone back for a month in the fall. I honestly can't even remember, but it was a long stretch of time. It was probably six to seven months that he had been home and was doing the virtual schooling. And then my little one had never gone to school. And so he was actually very convinced, my little guy, that he was not going to kindergarten. He was staying home with me <laughs> for this school year. And so, you know, it was 
very interesting, number one, to navigate being home with them for that long a period of time, you know, as I'm sure anybody else who is a caregiver or a parent of any age children, um, you know, and, and if they work as well, I feel as though it's been quite challenging. I mean, the pandemic has been challenging for everybody on all different levels and for many different reasons. I find as a parent, right, when I wear my parent hat, you know, being home with your kids and trying to navigate work and serve them and be present with them. It, that was for me, one of the most difficult things I have ever had to navigate. Because if you think about, you know, when you become an adult and you're working and if you decide you want to become a parent, or if you end up becoming a caregiver for, you know, any age child, I don't think society ever meant for us to be working <laughs> and parenting or caregiving at the same time, you know, in the same space, no break, <laughs> you know? And so that has been, that was very difficult. And, and I, on a personal level, maybe even a professional level, I do feel the effects of, I don't want to say the burden, you know, because we were blessed to be healthy and to be home and to be safe. Um, but it was quite a challenging situation on many different levels. And I find that, you know, I'm having to, when I'm serving my clients, you know, we're unpacking that a lot of the feeling and the emotion and the hardship and the trauma, honestly, right? Like, let's call it what it mm -hmm. is, because that is hard um, with themselves, but also with me too. And so it's been a lot of offering myself grace in these last few weeks since they've been back to school of, of working through all that and letting myself feel that it, it has really been a lot. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think there's been like so many points of grieving throughout this like entire mm -hmm. situation. And it's kind of like your world gets tipped like upside down. And then as we do as humans, <clears throat> we adapt. Right. So it's like right. you come up with new routines and new schedules and new ways of like making it work. And then your like world gets tipped on its axis again. Right. And there's like mm -hmm. another grieving period of like, Oh, you know, like my kids and my husband are no longer at home anymore. <laughs> like what do I do with that time and yeah. space and quiet? <laughs> That's right. That's right. It was almost like being thrust again into this whole new world where I, exactly what you said, I, I didn't remember what quiet felt like. I had no idea. And, you know, again, as I've said, I mean, we were very blessed. Um, our family um, through the pandemic to not lose anyone, to not, um, you know, face some of the catastrophic losses that so many others have faced during this time period and continue to. Um, at the same time, it's been hard in other ways. And when they all went back to school, I remember the first day when it was actually quiet and I was like, in my mind and in my body, my nervous system, it was almost like I had I didn't know what to do with myself because I was experiencing something that I forgot what it was like. It was so interesting. Um, and I have to say um, what I feel most blessed with for this entire period has been the skills and practices that I've developed through Ayurveda, through the daily intentional actions of showing up for myself through nourishment and physical activity, breathing and meditation, all of the ways that for so many years I had been cultivating that practice and that skill, I never realized, I mean, I always knew how important and valuable they were, but I have to be honest, when it comes to saving my sanity, when it comes to finding the energy to show up when I felt like I didn't have any more, it's because of those practices. And I've never been so thankful for learning how to take care of myself um, when, when I thought it was challenging, but it turned out to be easier <laughs> than it ever was in the pandemic. And so I do, I feel blessed in that way. Really, I do, um, because it's been a long period, a long trying period. Um, and I think had I not had these skills, had I not had these practices, things might've turned out much differently for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A hundred percent. I completely agree with that. And I think that I've felt very much the same, like very grateful for, you know, having a solid morning routine and having a really solid movement practice and a really mm -hmm. solid, you know, relationship with 
meditation and journaling and introspection during those times where I was like, what on earth is going on in the world right now? And yeah, I feel like having that, having that strong foundation and that strong base is just like really, really important during these crazy times. And hopefully we're on the up and up with everything. And <laughs> the next time we have a conversation, maybe we don't have to talk about the pandemic, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, I appreciate Your you. Your listeners are probably like, well, enough already. We've heard it. We know. <laughs> no, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think we all know at this point, but I think it's also nice to hear kind of, you know, other people's experiences. And I know you're certainly not alone in terms of the, the shift as a caregiver and as a business owner and as a mom and that type of thing. So appreciate you sharing that with me. And um, yeah, let's dive into winter. So winter is interesting to me because I think it's technically like December, December 21st is like winter solstice. So that's when winter technically begins, but I grew up in Canada. Winter has already started in Canada. <laughs> it starts sometime in September, October. Our ski hills are open in November in Western Canada. So, you know, things are very different. But, you know, I live most of the year in Mexico now. And here in Mexico, I mean, we still have really, really beautiful weather. And while this, you can feel the seasons changing into fall and we will get a little bit of, you know, quote unquote winter, it's like so different from how I grew up with this concept of winter. So I have sort of this like love hate relationship with winter. I love it if I can be away and I, you know, (laughs) kind of hate it if I have to be there. So I'd love to just hear like how we can kind of be more well for winter. Cause I think that there's a lot of people that sort of dread this time of like the leaves fall, the snow comes, it's dark, it's cold, all of that type of stuff. Yes. All of that. (laughs) All of that. And, um, you know, it's funny because for me, I live in New Jersey. And so here we experience for the most part, all four seasons, um, in the stereotypical summer, the stereotypical spring, you know, so there is a temperature change. There's changes in the quality of the atmosphere. And so it's, it's funny that you have the experience of living in Canada where you also probably did have you know, the different changes of seasons, I would assume, even though winter probably was the longest. (laughs) Winter is definitely the longest. (laughs) It's like real life Game of Thrones. It's like winter's (laughs) coming and then winter is like there for a long, long, long time. (laughs) Wow. Remind me never to move to Western Canada. (laughs) All of Canada is pretty bad in all fairness. (laughs) No, we do have all the seasons though. We do have spring and we do have fall. Those shoulder seasons are just a little bit shorter and winter is definitely like the majority of the, I would say the year. Okay. All right. And then to live then in Mexico where, I I mean, my assumption would be, you know, a cold day in Mexico might be 60 degrees, I would guess. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, that's probably about what it'll be like during the day you know, in central Mexico on the coast, it's like, even, it doesn't even get that cold, but yeah, yeah, it might get down to like maybe like the forties at night, but they normally don't go below freezing in most of the cities in Mexico. Yeah. 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 So, and then, so that's the thing about winter time, because for some areas of the world, it is such a drastic change, right? You know, for, and, and for instance, like here in New Jersey, the summertime, we can get up to the, you know, in the nineties, even into the hundreds, in terms of, you know, Fahrenheit temperature. But then in the winter time, you know, in the dead of January or, or February, it could be in the teens. So, you know, it when we talk about winter and the qualities of winter being cold or dry or wet, dark, those qualities may not be felt everywhere in the US or everywhere in the in North America or across the globe. However, qualities of winter are present, even if the atmosphere and the environment doesn't have those drastic changes as they do say in Canada or here in the Northeast of the United States as well. And so what I was so excited about talking about in this conversation with you is the presence of mind that is needed in the winter because our experience can change depending on where we live geographically and also day to day. So for instance, here in New Jersey, it could be completely wet, snowy, 
blizzardy one day and then the next day completely cold and dry. There may be snow on the ground, but that wetness from the atmosphere is gone and it's just bitter, dry, cold. And those two uh, different types of days offer different qualities and different effects within us as well. And so when it comes to winter, you have some people who naturally may be affected by, you know, that winter dullness and heaviness. People may identify with seasonal depression or seasonal affective disorder. While for other people, it can be a time of great anxiety. And so it's important for people to become aware of their tendencies and also aware of tools for managing both, both essences, both fields, both environments. Again, whether or not they experience the big, enormous changes in the atmosphere or not, those qualities are going to be there and may change day to day. And so that self-awareness is very important in the wintertime. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. I feel like this is all very relatable to me in terms of just like feeling you know, a little bit slower and more tired and, um, you know, feeling like the darkness and the heaviness of winter. And I think that, you know, winter is obviously a reality and there's, there's a lot of beauty that comes from changing seasons too. And I think that is something I've actually recognized from living in places where they have kind of like less seasons. Like I've lived in like Mexico, I think has, you know, changes of seasons, but I've also lived in Panama and Panama is like, they'll tell you they have summer and rainy season. So they don't have four seasons and it's hot all the time. Like, like it's humid and hot in rainy season and it's like hot and dry in summer. So it's kind of this experience of like, you never really get like the cooling off and the changing of like your clothing and stuff like that. So I can certainly appreciate that there's a lot of beauty in like the changing seasons and changing our rhythms and stuff, but I'd love to hear a bit more about like, you know, how do we kind of like take care of ourselves during this season and especially the season that can be challenging for so many of us? Yeah, for sure. You know, by and large, the key for winter is, you know, turning inward towards yourself. If you take that stereotypical cold, maybe snowy day that, you know, that little, maybe even thinking of it in like dusk or the beginning of dark, um, that feeling of, Um, retreating to yourself, thinking of hibernation, you know, hibernation that happens in the winter, whether that's of animals or plants and trees and things like that, Um, you know, really turning towards that self-care, that self-reflection, taking time really to nurture and nourish yourself. People will, you know, and there's a change that happens in the winter period, you know, especially in the Northern hemisphere in terms of, you know, that, going into those darker days and then, you know, going into the new year, especially too, you know, where people are starting to, you know, at the end of the uh, calendar year, look toward what do I want for the next year? How do I want to feel? What do I want to achieve? And all of those ideas and and processes are very important for your well-being, because I think especially for those people who maybe feel dark and stuck in, you know, these dark days or just in that feeling of the air, you know, having those things to look forward to those plans and those shifts to their behavior that they, that they want to implement in order to feel a little different is important. And so, you know, when we talked about the fall shifts and fall well-being, we talked about six major um, focuses for the fall. Um, And I think that, you know, for me, these are always the six things that I focus on when I talk to clients about Ayurveda practices and how to optimize your well-being. And so the first one is living within nature, right? So honoring what's going on outside. If it's cold and dry, bringing in warmth, moisture uh, into your, into your atmosphere inside, into your food, um, making sure that you're cultivating that in everything it is that you do. But again, then being careful that too much of that warmth, too much of that um, moisture may leave you feeling heavy, right? And so again, that awareness of balance, of not going completely in that direction, um, but allowing yourself to have 
a balance between um, bringing in moisture and heat, but then not too much where it leaves you feeling dull and stuck at the at the end of it all. And for those people who have a more kapha dominance, right? So that that dominance of that moisture, that that dullness, that heaviness, that sluggishness, they have to be very careful to include some movement, some um, variability in their schedule, maybe some spontaneity in their schedule, their meditation, breathing, yoga practices may look a little different as well, because they may have to be very conscious of uplifting their energy uh, versus, you know, somebody who tends to get anxious, maybe because it's very cold and dry where they live, or that's just their tendency. Maybe they have a high vata dominance. And so they're going to move towards more of those grounding practices, uh, grounding breathing, grounding yoga, um, really leaning towards the moist foods and the oily foods and the stews and the soups and things like that, those, the root vegetables and things um, in their diet to create that stability that they need. And, um, and so that's a good place to start in terms of, you know, if people listening to this conversation is considering what are my tendencies during the winter? Like, how do I experience the winter months? I think that's a good place for people to start because you may not have realized that you had a tendency, you know, for anybody who doesn't know their dosha dominance, right? And you don't need to you know, necessarily know that. It's great to know it, obviously, because it's it helps you to use these practices in a more personal basis. But a great way to start is simply looking back, you know, traditionally in the winter, how do I experience it? What is my mindset usually? How am I affected? And then choosing some of those opposite qualities to bring balance is is a good place to start. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, for anyone who doesn't know their 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 doshas, I feel like that's, you know, so, so helpful, at least for me to kind of understand like my sort of natures and tendencies. And mm-hmm. I'd love to hear a little bit about like, so you talked about Kafa and how how they kind of get. I guess like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, um, influenced by winter and kind of how they feel and stuff. And I feel like I can relate to that, having some kapha in my, <laughs> in my, in my doshas, but how about pitta and vata? Like how does winter kind of show up for them? Like for pitta, is it kind of like, you know, the cooling is helpful. Like it slows them down a little bit, or is it like, you know, yeah. How does it show up? Yeah. So it definitely does cool them. It's especially a nice change coming out of summer where pitta is very high. Mm-hmm. And even in the fall, depending on where you live and, you know, that that buildup of pitta can still be high or or present in the fall months. Um, you know, it's it's nice. It's a nice time. Winter is a nice time for pitta. But also, you know, depending how their pitta is um, expressed, it could uh, definitely lead to, you know, feelings of, um, I don't want to say anxiousness, but, you know, cause pit does want to do right. They want to achieve, they want to compete. They want to, uh, you know, do as much as they can, but the winter is slow. <laughs> so it can leave people feeling very impatient and feeling like they're not doing enough. Um, and so pit does really can benefit from the winter time of that introspection of that slowing down, like you said, of, being very present in everything it is that they do in order to be sure that they're doing the best work, whether that is in serving themselves or serving others. You know, it's, it's a very wonderful introspective time and hard on the ego for pittas, that's for sure, but what they need for sure. And, um, without a doubt. Yeah. Yeah. My husband has quite a bit of pitta and I feel like he kind of like at the end of summer, especially if we've been somewhere like quite warm, he's like, you know, craving kind of that, that coolness a little bit. I feel like he intuitively kind of knows when he gets too fiery and wants to, wants to cool off a little bit. Like he's like, Oh, the morning air is so fresh now. Like, Oh, I just want to take cold showers and stuff like that. So that's really (laughs) interesting to hear. And then what about Vata? How does it show up for them? You know, for Vata, it could show up in increased feelings of overwhelm or anxiety. Um, it it can be a hard time, you know, because again, like it, even though that kind of goes against the grain of what we imagine winter to be and how we might feel, but 
you know, when you're not able to go and do or see people or, you know, life has slowed down and you're like, wait, you know, you know, I'm, I'm kind of feeling um, a little untethered about that. And, you know, it can be hard. It can be very hard for me because um, um, I do have a Vata dominance. Um, I don't really struggle in the winter time as much as I do in the transition from winter to spring. That's really where my struggle is. Um, and so what is interesting is that your experience can be different. Even if you and I, let's just say, are Vata dominant, we may experience the winter time very differently. And so what's important um, for anybody with a Vata dominance, if you're living in a place that is airy and cool, that you stick to a grounding routine in the morning, um, that you focus on practices that will help you create stability in your day, that you will allow yourself some warmth throughout your morning, whether that is, say, for instance, going into a gentle yoga practice, maybe um, ujjayi breathing, right? That ocean-like fire, you know, not fire, but that ocean-like sound that creates warmth within the body is wonderful for creating that warmth. Um, a stabilizing yoga practice is really, really important. So like grounding down as much as you can through those hands, those feet being on the ground. If you're waking up and you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling a little agitated, um, that's important. And then, you know, honoring that wind down at the end of the day is important. You know, allowing yourself to um, feel grounded in what you achieved and how you showed up for yourself, you know, doing the checks in with yourself throughout the day. What do I need right now? What's going to nourish me in this moment is going to be very important for vatas, but turning to those grounding practices is going to be important if they're finding that, that, um, that agitation and that airiness is, is, is quite high for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I can uh, definitely relate that <laughs> as having quite a bit of Vata as well as like this. And maybe that's one of the reasons I, you know, don't like summer or don't like uh, winter. Sorry. Is that, you know, it's like slows me down quite a bit and that can be, that can be hard sometimes, but I think that that, that idea of like honoring your nature and the circumstances is like a really important first tip. So thank you so much for sharing that. What is the, the second tip for winter well-being? So the second tip is going to be feeding your senses, which for those people who live in those like really cold places <laughs> where you're like, I don't even want to go outside, you know, maybe you have to then create the experiences within your home or places that you can safely go to if, if you know, you can drive somewhere or something like that. Um, hopefully, um, you know, things are safe enough for people to be getting out in the world still. Um, and, you know, it's about enjoying experiences. And here's the thing, you know, when, if people are, you know, not seeing their friends and family as much, it can be depressing, you know, for people who, you know, life is slowing down, that's depressing. So it's important all the time, but especially in the winter time, if you find that your tendency is to be a little bit more sad, um, to feel a little bit of loss, that you in, you build in those enjoyment breaks throughout the day. So little, little pieces, whether that's a minute or three minutes, a time to dance to your favorite song, whether it's some gentle stretching, a quick conversation with somebody who fills you up, you know, those enjoyment breaks. And, and feeding the senses, right, through sights, through sounds, allowing yourself to feel a range of emotions. Obviously, you know, we have to deal with some hard emotions sometimes, but all the good emotions, allowing yourself to laugh and be lighthearted at different points of the day is going to be um, important. And even in the winter months, getting outside, even if it's cold, is going to be good because that blast of fresh air can be really amazing if for people who feel that dull darkness, like ugh, opening the winter window and getting that burst of cold air on their skin, number one feeds the senses, like the skin senses so much, but it has the ability to kind of refocus the brain. It's almost like jumpstarting the brain. You can close the window right after that. You don't have to like keep it open and freeze yourself, but you know, allowing yourself to experience outside because I find, you know, if it's, if even if it's snowy, outside, but it's safe for me, safe to walk. It's not icy. 
it's so beautiful outside. And even in that crisp coolness, it allows for so much mental clarity because sometimes staying inside with the forced heat, it can be a lot. It can be overwhelming sometimes. And so getting out there and having like literally the change of scenery, the change of temperature can be so, so wonderful for feeding all of your senses. Yeah, no, I think that that is a good reminder. Like, even if you don't like the cold, it's so important to go outside and like feel that on your skin and, you know, take a walk in nature and, and whatnot. And I think that that's just like a good reminder for (laughs) people like me who maybe don't like feeling cold. It's like, you can go out for like five minutes or even like you said, maybe open, yeah, bundle up or maybe just open a window or go out on your like back balcony if you have that. And I think just being able to kind of, yeah, feed the senses, like you said, is, is super important. Hey everyone, we're just taking a quick break from the show to talk about energy bits. Energy bits are spirulina tablets made of one ingredient, algae. Nothing added, nothing subtracted, just 100% plant-based algae nutrition. No sugar, no caffeine, no gluten, no soy, no additives, no GMOs, no preservatives, no binders, nothing artificial. Just 100% algae, 100% green, 100% healthy, and 100% pure. Pure and simple, the way food should be. They have high protein, high beta carotene, high iron, high chlorophyll, high antioxidants, and over 40 plus vitamins, including the B vitamins. They have electrolytes, including magnesium, potassium, and are a great source of essential fatty acids. Honestly, I could go on and on and on about how great energy bits are for you. And that's why I've decided to partner with them. If you want to learn more about energy bits or order some yourself, you can head on over to energybits.com to learn more. Use the code WANDERBARN to get 20% off your order. Once again, that's energybits.com and use the code WANDERBARN for 20% off your order. All right, back to the episode. And then what about when it comes to food? Ooh, such a good topic. So in the winter, just as with any season, seasonal foods is so important. So whatever is growing outside your door, you know, in your area of the world, that's what you want to focus on eating. And always, always, always Ayurveda um, suggests and, or I should say not suggests, but guides us to eat cooked or, you know, cooked warm food that at the least is room temperature, if not warm and uh, well spiced is important as well to help with digestion and the calming of the nervous system. And so, you know, in the winter time, it's, you know, we could eat heating vegetables, like the root vegetables, radishes, carrots, um, onion, we get spinach and, and spices like garlic. Chili is a great time. So like any of people who really like spicy foods, it's a great time for bringing warmth. But again, if you're, you know, if, if um, those pittas who might be feeling angry <laughs> in the moment or feeling, you know, high pitta in the moment, they may want to back off. So again, this, that awareness of the moment is important. Um, but you know, the, the warming, um, the warming foods are, are going to be really wonderful. And this is the, this is the time where, you know, those mushy, you know, soups and the stews and um, all of that is so wonderful. Oatmeal for breakfast in the morning. Some people really love kitchery. So it's that rice and the, the, um, the split peas or the, or the different um, types of split peas, um, the dal, uh, steamed vegetables are great, especially for those in the cold, dry climates. So on the days where it's cold and dry, steaming the veggies to allow there to be a little bit of moisture is really important. Um, it's a great time to have whole wheat for people who can have whole wheat. Um, legumes are great. And then, you know, ghee is wonderful to use in the winter time. Um, and using that like just a little little like drop of it on your your food that's completely cooked you know just to especially for um vata will add that uh oiliness and combat the dryness of the winter people can have eggs and poached or hard boiled is really good in the winter months and then for anybody who eats meat they might turn to chicken turkey venison a good idea for our dairy consumers is to have a little bit of a reduction in dairy because it does create mucus. And because of the moisture of the, you know, of that quality of kapha, um, 
we are ten, we're kind of tending in the, the direction of, of of moisture, you know, anyway within our system. And so maybe, you know, I'm not saying eliminate, obviously, but like just cutting down a little bit would be a good idea. And then as always, uh, reducing cool, cold, frozen and warm and raw foods, sorry, cool, cold, frozen and raw foods is going to be your best bet. So that way we keep digestion um, going smoothly. Digestion is highest in the winter. So pitta is, you know, firing nicely in the winter time, which is really wonderful to keep our, our kind of furnace up. Um, and so we want to make sure that we don't cool it or make it, um, more difficult by having those raw cold foods. Yeah, for sure. Less smoothies, more stews, moderate amounts of eggnog. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> yeah. No, and I think that that makes sense too. It feels very like, as you talk about that, that feels very intuitive to me. I think it's pretty rare that I'm like craving a salad or a smoothie in like the dead of winter. <laughs> um, it's yes. definitely more like, you know, those soups, stews, warmer teas, warmer drinks, kind of like turmeric lattes, that type of thing, um, which I think totally makes sense. And I, I think part of, you know, this, like living with the seasons is listening to that. And I think we can get caught up in, well, I should eat a salad or something like that. And it's like, well, maybe you actually shouldn't eat a salad because, you know, it's freezing cold outside and your body's craving something that's like warm and nourishing and, and warming for it. I guess one question I have for you, and this comes from coming from a place where pretty much everything dies in the winter is, you know, if you don't have a lot growing locally, like traditionally where I'm from, people would have, you know, they would have like dried meats or like cured meats for the winter. They would have pickled a lot of things. Um, there'd be lots of like, you know, potatoes and root vegetables that keep for a long time that would have, you know, been kept in kind of a, an old school type of fridge. Um, you know, how do we make sure we're getting like enough, I guess, like nutrients and minerals while also honoring that seasonality? Like, I, I feel like eating maybe like a mango in the middle of winter in Western Canada is probably, you know, a weird move. Cause it obviously came from a long way away, but how do we kind of find that balance? If that's a great question. And it's something that is a struggle for a lot of people, depending on where it is that they live. And so, you know, Ayurveda doesn't have many absolutes, right? And so we have to use our discretion and we have to, you know, do what we need to and adjust things as, as necessary. And so if that means then that, you know, if spinach, let's just say, is not grown in your area, I mean, I could tell you in New Jersey, there's no spinach growing anywhere in New Jersey in the wintertime, you know, and then so if you need to go to the frozen, then you have to go to the frozen, right? You know, as as much as we, um, you know, want our food to come from the earth, you're right. You know, you need to make sure that you have other nutrients. And so, if it, you know, if it's coming from a different area of the world, um, and that, and you have to make do with that, you can. I do. You still use, you know, frozen spinach and things like that uh, because sometimes I'm just craving that spinach, and so I make it a a point to then cook it with. Uh, the right oils for the season, uh, you know, onion and garlic are wonderful and warming and then, you know, flavor it with, with the warming spices. And then it kind of regenerates itself, which is really, really good. And so you do, you have to use what's there, what's, what's around your area, but then, you know, you can add little things here and there um, because again, you know, you got to just do the best that you can and you may not always have a wide variety of, of items to choose from that are natural grown there. Yeah, for sure. That definitely makes sense. And I think that it's also too, I mean, we live in like such a, a blessed time where we're able to, you know, get food from all over the world and we've got kind of this like global trade happening. So, I mean, it's really amazing to live somewhere like New Jersey or Canada where you can get, you know, frozen spinach, which, you know, I'm sure our ancestors a hundred years ago would have been like, that's sweet. Eat your spinach. <laughs> we don't have that. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I love that. Thanks for, thanks for touching on that. And then what about when it comes to like meal timing and meal sizes, what should we be aware of? So meal timing pretty much stays the same. I mean, you know, if your schedule does change a little bit in terms of the winter time, some people like to sleep in. I mean, usually within Ayurveda, we are, you know, saying 
you know, wake up with the sun, but we know that in the winter months, the sun can rise much later. I mean, right now, you know, you might be finding like, oh my gosh, it's just so dark <laughs> until like seven, eight o'clock in the morning, depending on where you might be living. Um, and so, you know, you do want to be out of bed by seven. And usually our breakfast time that we advise people is between seven and eight, eight o'clock in the morning. And so, you know, sticking to, nicely to that would be good. Still keeping within the 12 to one o'clock lunchtime and that being the biggest meal of the day is very important to ensure that your full digestion has occurred by the time you want to go to bed. Um, and then, you know, dinner happening anywhere between 530 and seven, which is funny, you know, when it's getting dark in some areas of the world at 4 p.m., you're, you feel like you're waiting an eternity <laughs> to get to 530 even to have your dinner. Um, but that's important. So, you know, and then, and then sticking to the not having anything after 7 PM is still important because you don't want to interrupt the digestion of your dinner, as well as all of the processes that have to happen overnight for the body to release the day, digest the day and do its regenerative processes to have you feeling well in the morning is going to be important. So, you know, the meal timing pretty much does stay the same, but again, I think it's important when we talk about any guidelines within Ayurveda, for some people, it feels very strict and stringent and that can be overwhelming. You know, it can have people feeling put off. And I think what is important is that people understand what we're trying to do with any of these guidelines that we're talking about today, any of these shifts is that we're trying to create balance. We are trying to create um, a system, just the same as you know that the sun is going to set and then rise the next day you know, different processes that happen within the earth. We're trying to create those same cycles within the body. And then that allows us to be adaptive when we need to say, for instance, if, if our work schedule changes, or if you have children or you're, you're a caregiver for somebody and that schedule changes, or, you know, like in New Jersey, where in the fall, it could be 40 degrees, or it could be 80 degrees in the winter. It could also get up to 70 degrees. I, my birthday falls in February. And one year it was 80 degrees on February 25th. And I could not believe it. I didn't think I would live my entire lifetime to ever have 80 degrees in New Jersey in February. But again, whether you're living in a pandemic that you never could have trained for and prepared for in your entire life, you know, these processes are not meant to be strict so that you can't enjoy life. It is to give you the foundation to enjoy life and to not completely lose track or lose your way when life happens, when challenges happen. And so, you know, sticking to these meal times, sticking to these guidelines is important, but know that you can shift them if you need to. Day to day, you know, week to week, you can change it. Nothing bad is going to happen. As long as, by and large, again, the 80-20 rule, 80% of the time you're you know, kind of adhering to this and understanding the why. I think the why is really important for people to know. Why am I eating at this certain time? Why is my biggest meal of the day lunchtime? Again, it's all about digestion. It's all about gut health, right? The actual digestion of food, but also the digestion of the day. You want to wake up the next day feeling rested. And the only way we can do that is to ensure that we've properly digested the day overnight. Yeah, no, for sure. That definitely makes sense. And I think too, like, I feel like having kind of, you know, these, these guidelines is really helpful. Cause I feel like, you know, if you're somebody like me who feels like winter is hard, like sometimes you just want to bury yourself in like a whole thing of lasagna or something <laughs> like that. And it's like, well, lasagna is like, you know, a beautiful meal to enjoy. And, you know, especially something that's really fun to cook and enjoy with family and friends, you can just eat like a normal portion size and then, you know, kind of move on, assuming that you're feeling full at that point. So yeah, I think that that's a good, a good tip to remember. I think that's the a next... great point that you make. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut no, you no, off. you go ahead. Um, I think that's a great point that you make. And when we're talking about food, I had the thought and then I forgot it. Um, you know, when we were talking about honoring, whether it's your dosha dominance overall, right, naturally, or, or, and I should say, and how you're feeling in the moment, when you asked, you know, how does the winter season affect kapha? How does it affect the vata? And particularly since those are the kind of the two dominant qualities of wintertime. I think it's important to your note about the lasagna, 
that you can adjust your meals, right? I talked about yoga, breathing and meditation, but your meals, your food choices can also change and should change based on how you're feeling. So if you're feeling agitated, overwhelmed, worried, then going towards those oily, warming, grounding foods is going to be very important for you. So shifting what you're eating that morning for breakfast or that day for lunch or in that dinner, or maybe you're feeling like that for a few days, right? So adjusting what you're cooking for yourself, if you're buying food, whatever it is that you're doing, because as much as we want you to cook your own food from you know local sourced ingredients, life happens, right? And you have to make adjustments. So no judgment on how you're getting your food. Um, but also if you're feeling dark and dull, then maybe you're not going to have those heavy soups or heavy stews, but you're going towards a lighter fare, not meaning salads, like you were saying, right? But starting to discern, and i that's the beauty of when you really get into this practice of mindfully preparing your food or even just mindful living. All of this stuff that we're talking about is all about mindful living. Um, in, and to be able to identify all right, I'm feeling kind of just dull, inert, like, blah, like you were saying, you know, what can I eat right now that is going to not fuel that continuing feeling in me, right? What's a little lighter food that I can have? And I think it's important for people to start to learn that, you know, it's the continuum isn't, you know, either heavy soups and stews or salad. There's so much in between, <laughs> that you can have, you know, whether it's um, bringing in your grains as your quote unquote lighter meal, you know, so you're having grains with some vegetables, of course, you know, a lighter protein for those who, who enjoy meat. I think it's important to note that, that included in your shifts based on how you're feeling also should be your food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for touching on that. That definitely makes sense and is super helpful. And then what about when it comes to like exercise and yoga? How does, how do we take care of ourselves with that in the winter? So again, also based on how you're feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Makes I don't sense. Know if, anybody, if anybody's sick of hearing me saying that yet, the ideal time to work out uh, and, and exercise is, you know, between 6 and 10 a.m. and p.m. Um, in the winter time, especially it's wonderful in the morning because it gets your day started, right? So if you're feeling that look, like, ugh you know, sluggishness, it's wonderful to get yourself moving. And so if you are dominated by Vata, if it's cold, dry, airy, maybe you're favoring that slow, gentle, grounded yoga, um, strength training, focusing on longer, um, longer strength training bouts, heavier weights is wonderful too. And for cardio, you should do cardio, right? So longer, more endurance cardio is important. Uh, take a good time warming up. That's going to be important because you want to raise the heart rate slowly, but also make sure that you are warming up the muscles. If especially if you know it's cold in wherever it is that you live, both outside and inside your your home, um, and lubricating the joints for those who are vata dominant. You know it could be a hard time on the joints in the winter time, and so allowing those joints to be nicely warmed up um, is going to be important more stretching, especially on the ground is important. So whether it's after cardio, after strength training, or in your yoga practice, more stretching, longer holds in yoga is going to be important. Connecting to that breath, um, connecting to your affirmation, you know, whatever I am statement or focal point you have really working on that muscle heat <laughs> is going to be important. Um, and that can be tough for, you know, the Kapha dominant people who, you know, kind of just want to maybe lay there, <laughs> you know, so um, standing strength and balance is wonderful. And most importantly, a longer Shavasana is going to be very important. Um, and then restorative yoga is also wonderful in the winter season, especially for those who need more grounding. Um, but for those who are, you know, on the Kapha dominant days or those who are dominated by the qualities of Kapha, you might kind of move towards a more, a faster pace practice than what Vata's might be doing, um, a little bit more intense. So with strength training, you know, if you're using, um, weights or any sort of external resistance or, or if you're just using body weight, changing up the moves 
maybe making things more complicated, shorter rest periods. We're talking about wanting to create more uplifting and change because Kafa is usually not great with change. So uh, bringing in some of those opposing qualities is going to be important for Kafa. Um, cardio can be um, intense or a little bit more vigorous. Um, again, though, taking a good time warming up is going to be important. And then you can definitely on those Kafic days or, you know, for those who are Kafa dominant, you know, even though we want to stretch more, they can do standing stretches, dynamic stretching, meaning you're including more, more movement in your stretches versus just static holds for 30 to 60 seconds. Um, and with yoga, you know, they could definitely benefit from a sun salutation that is, you know, moving, you know, going through warrior ones, warrior twos, reverse warriors are going to be really wonderful and uplifting. And then, you know, even going into forward bends or back bends that are a little more stimulating. So cobra is going to be wonderful. Bow, side plank is going to be great. So still working on that abdominal strength, that stability within the body. And for anybody who's suffering from a cold um, or like congestion during the winter months, you know, getting that chest open is going to be very important for clearing the lungs and all of that. Um, which is going to be good. And then any work that you're getting into the abdomen is going to work into the lung area, which will be good too. And then for Kapha, you know, they could do a supported Shavasana um, and then, you know, heating breaths, uplifting breaths, that'll be good um, to kind of um, stimulate digestion. And then for everyone, um, alternate nostril breathing is wonderful. I cannot say enough between fall and and honestly, through to spring, but even in the summertime, alternate nostril breathing is so wonderful because it is so balancing um, for all of the doshas and all the qualities is, is, is so wonderful. And then full torso breathing is going to be good for, um, for um, energizing the body, balancing the energy as well. Yeah, for sure. That's great. I, I love all of that. And I think that having this, the preface of like, do what feels good to you to start with is, is really good. And then finding, you know, different ways to exercise and to change your yoga practice from there is, is really beautiful. So thank you for that. Um, I know our next little tip is going to be, I guess, maybe sort of on the same line of this, maybe a little bit different, but take it easy. I know we've talked about this a little bit already, but how do we kind of bring in this idea of like, you know, winter's a slower time. It's okay to slow down into our, into our life, into our winter season. I think that we should take a cue from mother nature. Um, mm -hmm. no matter where you live, there is a change in the winter time and there is just this innate slowing down and we should take our cue from that because, uh, there has to be a time period in our lives where we slow down, you know, we cannot go, go, go all the time. And, you know, coming from the fall season where it's variable and interchangeable and so many shifts to our schedules and the way the day is that allowing ourselves that rest from the fall and the preparation then to go into spring, into that beautiful growing um, time is it's necessary in the winter then to take that time, that break. And, um, you know, while we do naturally then slow down because there's less to do in the winter, if you live in a colder area, um, you know, I think that it's a wonderful time to, you know, really invest in your hobbies, investing your time and the things that lift you up, that light you up, that you enjoy, that maybe you were too busy to, in, to do in the summertime or the fall. And now you've got a little bit more time. So as much as maybe your tendency might want to be to like, you know, just watch Netflix <laughs> for a large stretch of time, I might, you know, suggest, why don't you cut that in half and, you know, reignite, especially if it's been a long time. Like if you're like, I don't even know anymore what my hobbies are. Well, this is a great time to figure that out and bring in that time, bring in time for quiet time, reflective time. And also time for yourself is important. And I mean, like by yourself, not just, you know, quietly in the space of others, but also alone by yourself doing things you enjoy or being quiet. Another thing with taking it easy though, is that because, um, 
darkness comes so early in the winter, it's a good season to skip naps. And so my nappers are not going to be happy with me (laughs) saying that, but you know, the early darkness provides ample time for downtime. And so, you know, it, and, and then it lends itself for a good time getting to bed. You know, it's, it's harder in the spring and the summer when daylight is longer to get to bed at nine o'clock when in some areas of the country, it's still bright sun at that time or around the world, I should say. Um, and so taking it easy, allowing yourself to enjoy more, but on also skipping the naps, <laughs> it's a good idea. Yeah. I mean, it kind of makes sense to skip the naps, especially if you live somewhere that's the sun setting at like four 30, you know, five o'clock, because if you take a nap at like, I don't know, three, like, how are you going to get yourself out of bed? You know? And I've totally yeah. done this before where I like wake up from a nap and it's dark out and I'm like, do I eat dinner tonight? Or do we just keep yeah. sleeping? <laughs> like it's an actual conversation in my head. <laughs> yes. Yes. Which, yes. Yes. Which that actually brings us to the last thing we're going to talk about, which is sleep. Uh, can we talk about sleep for, for winter? And and I'm curious about this one because I know like a lot of, we kind of talked about, you know, look at what nature does and a lot of animals sleep through all of winter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I, it's so important when we talk about rest, rest really is sleep. And, you know, wanting to make sure you set yourself up for the best quality sleep is so very important. And that begins the, the night of sleep we are going to have begins from the way we start our day. Number one, um, how we treat ourselves throughout the day, as well as the powering down process. And so it's important to begin that powering down process between 6 and 7 p.m. And I want to be clear that that does not mean that we are completely disengaging with the world and shutting everything down at that time. That is not it. It's not a be all end all, but it's a gradual powering down, a gradual, you know, because for a lot of people, they're leaving work at that time. Um, You know, kids' practices are coming to an end around that time. And so it's an easy way to begin saying goodbye to the day and beginning to look towards setting yourself up for good sleep. And so uh, trying your best to stop working at least two hours before bed, Um, maybe taking some time to prepare for tomorrow so that the next day doesn't feel so like, oh, and, you know, overwhelming, or if you're feeling lethargic. To just not do the things anyway, you know, but just taking some time to decide what you're going to wear tomorrow. What's your lunch going to be? Maybe do some prep for your meals is going to be good. Uh, maybe creating your schedule for, are you working out? What are you doing? Where do you need to be? Just getting your mind around that and getting settled with it. And then starting those more quiet um self-nourishing evening rituals, whether that's taking time for breathing or meditation, journaling, maybe you follow a guided meditation, a yoga nidra, which I find is the one of the best things you could ever do for yourself in any season at the end of the day. A foot massage with an oil, um, what might be nice for you for nice warming and releasing. Um, having your screens off by nine, you're asleep by 10 maybe 11 at the latest, um, allowing yourself that period of time to really be restful. Because if we don't power down soon enough, if we don't release the day soon enough, we bring it to bed with us. And it does affect then the way we get to sleep as in terms of, you know, actually falling asleep. And then the quality of our sleep as well can be really impacted by that lack of powering down. Also, The body may do well, like you were saying, seems like everything sleeps (laughs) during the winter. The body may do well with more sleep in the winter. You might need that. However, people should pay attention if they start to feel more and more sluggish, you know, because it could, there's such a thing as, you know, if, if it's too much sleep or not very good quality sleep and then start to, you know, that make some adjustments in their day to ensure that they do feel more rested and ready to wake up when they, when they do get up in the morning. Um, is going to be important as well. Yeah, for sure. I think that that's great. And I know I'm always like 
you're ready to hibernate in the winter and get a, get a cozy sleep. So those are, those are really good tips. And I feel like this is so comprehensive, uh, but is there anything else you want to share any other, you know, pieces of advice or words of wisdom you want to leave listeners with when it comes to taking care of themselves this winter? I think that it's so important for us to break the myth that self-care is indulgent or something that we do for ourselves as a reward for getting our to-do list done or, you know, doing all the things or self-care is how we show up for ourselves when we've kind of hit the wall. I think that, you know, I'm kind of on a journey of myth busting and having people understand that showing up for yourself in daily intentional actions in the way that you eat, what you drink, how you move your body, the rest that you take, the way that you enjoy parts of your day. And um, all of these topics that we discussed, they're integral to your well-being through the season, from season to season, both physically, mentally, emotionally, and energetically. And so if anybody is interested in beginning to make shifts, my advice to you is start with one area of your life. Identify either the area of most need, but if that is overwhelming, then identify the place that's easiest to start and choose one thing. You're going to do just one. That might be setting your alarm for whatever time or eating a certain meal. Um, Do one thing for a couple of weeks. Get that set, work through the kinks, fail at it, come back to it. Get settled in it before you add on another thing because we can't do all the things. So start small, get it set, and then keep adding to it. Um, you can do it, but it's just like anything else. Small steps is is what works and you're worth it. You are worth it for sure. Amazing. I love that. That's super beautiful. And I think a really great place to end. I know I'm definitely feeling a bit more like inspired and empowered about winter. And maybe part of that is knowing that I get to spend winter in Mexico and not Canada, (laughs) but (laughs) either way, I feel like I've got all the tips now, which is really great. Um, so thank you, Steph. Can you share where people can go to find you, learn more about you, follow along with you if they would like? I would love it. Uh, my Instagram handle is Steph Galante. And then my website is stephgalante.com. And so I would love to hear from you. Please contact me with any questions at all. I am happy, happy, happy to uh, advise and serve. Amazing. Thank you so much for this conversation. It's been really awesome having you back on the show. I appreciate it so much. It is always so much fun chatting with you. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Matcha Mornings. To find links mentioned in this episode, show notes, photos, and more, head on over to wanderbarn.com forward slash podcast slash matcha dash mornings. To be the first to know about brand new episodes of Matcha Mornings, subscribe on your podcast app. If you enjoyed this episode of the show, please leave a review or send me an email at wanderbarn at gmail.com with the subject line Matcha Mornings. To follow along with me, Amanda Kingsmith, you can find me on Instagram at Amanda Kingsmith to learn more about other fun projects I'm working on. To find more great podcasts like this one on topics such as travel, the business of yoga, cryptocurrency, and more, head on over to wanderbarn.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you soon.